I understand also you were chairman of the special committee and the amendments to the city manager system of government and so yeah. on. So Right, it was called the Central Committee on Civic Government or City Government, and uh, we reviewed the city manager system and uh, the governmental system in India generally and recommended a, a number of things. Uh, one was, of course, the continuance of the city manager system, but we recommended that the city manager's title be changed to city administrator to more reflect uh, the role of the position, and that uh, his job was to administrate the city not manage it in the sense that one often thinks of managing, which is you know, complete control and calling the shots, and we felt that that name change might have some symbolic significance in the change name, or we did recommend it, that's the council accepted that. We recommended, among other things, that all department heads' reports uh, get to council, that if the city administrator did not agree with the departmental report, certainly we would register his uh, lack of agreement in his own report attached to the report, but we wanted to see what the department heads had to say, because we didn't feel that it was useful for council's decision making to have a department head who was an expert in a certain field have his views perhaps repressed at a point that uh, was, uh, um, uh, you know, before it got to us, and, and we had I don't know how good justification, but let's say some reason to believe that on occasion that may well have happened, that the views of the government didn't get through to us if they were contrary to the views of the administrator, the city manager at that time. Uh, we recommended that uh, also that the city uh, adopt a ward system. Uh, that was a recommendation that was controversial both on the part of, in the committee's debate, and it was also controversial uh, when it got to council, and it took a long while before that finally saw the light of day. But uh, those were the kinds of recommendations that we made. Um, it was a report that uh, took a long while, found it generated a lot of interesting discussions. Uh, uh, the outcome of that over the long haul was the uh, city administrator's title change, uh, the reporting system where department heads reports did get to council. The ward system can't make the claim that it was the committee's work only because there was a lot of public pressure for the ward system in the committee in the city and the enlargement of council um, Those were the, the major uh, effects of it. It was an interesting assignment. Uh, what about the uh, level of taxation in 1977? Do you think that was high low? Or what did you plan to do about that? The level of taxation in 1977. Uh, let me see. Why do you ask? 1977 particularly. Uh, well, did you have an alternative to property taxes? Mm, I've discussed alternatives, but I haven't proposed any specific one at any point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, the the uh, alternative uh, to property taxes is some form of income tax. Oh, I remember, yes. I proposed that, uh, that the municipalities get some specific share of the income tax. Uh, and other taxes collected by the provinces within a community uh, so that we wouldn't have to be completely dependent on the property tax. But uh, um, I've always felt that the property tax is a regressive and unfair tax and it's a very limiting on the fiscal uh, abilities of the, of the city, any city in the province, and has created a lot of inequitable differences between the cities. And the fact that, you know, the provinces had to make resource equalization grants and has to take into account all these equalization factors. There's testimony of the fact that the whole assessment system that, based, that the property tax is based on is fraught with all kinds of difficulties uh, and idiosyncrasies and makes the different situations of different cities, even though the different cities, maybe the people in them are no better off or worse off than each other. So you get situations where a city like London, uh, which certainly hasn't had uh, as severe economic problems as Windsor's over the last few years has continued to get uh, grants in excess of Windsor's. All of this uh, strikes me as uh, being sufficient proof that we need a total overhaul. I wouldn't say to eliminate the property tax system entirely, but certainly the property tax system should be only one component of the finances of the uh, other city. Uh, for one thing, uh, until it, its market value assessment 
which it is not in the province has been promising for years and years. And it's not tied at all to inflation, so it doesn't grow automatically at all. So the municipal governments are one level of government, and this is why they're so unpopular at times, that almost has to raise taxes on a yearly basis to actually change the tax rate, whereas the provincial and the federal governments can leave taxes, you know, the rates of taxes the same, but you know, the, the growth of the economy takes care of their uh, uh, increased needs. So these were these are ideas, and uh, they're ideas that have been pursued in uh, you know sort of a verbal sense only. We're talking about them, but the provinces are not you know light years away from. It is light years away from you know, uh, changing the the basis. They consider tax reform to be property tax reform for municipalities. So that's, uh, that's I would say, a dead issue, but it's certainly something that's not uh, on the day-to-day -day agenda for us. It wasn't then and it is not. Uh, turning to the city qualifier, mm -hmm. in 76 you uh, preferred to uh, campaign or uh, to their, um, Mayor Burt Weeks rather than mm -hmm. Alderman Phil. Mm -hmm. Uh, what were the issues at that time that made you come to that decision? Well, the major issue was competence. You know, there, there was absolutely no, you know, how shall I put it, they were winning the same league. Uh, uh, Alderman Farrell at the time simply couldn't have made a good mayor. Alderman Weeks, or excuse me, Mayor Weeks at that time, you know, had already proven himself to be one of the best mayors in Canada and one of the best mayors the city ever had. So, so what makes you say that? What has he done specifically? Oh, no, for one thing, very knowledgeable about civic matters, you know, and testified by the fact that uh, he, he had been uh, an important figure in the Ontario Municipal Association when it was that. Now it's the Association of Municipalities of Ontario. You know, so that his, his competence is recognized outside the city by people who govern other cities and who elect provincial representatives, but my own ability to see him operate, to know the level of his knowledge and, you know, really specific kind of knowledge in the areas like housing, to see him in negotiations with people, uh, and uh, to see how tenacious he is in uh, things he wants, uh, and his competence is uh, uh, beyond question, and that doesn't mean that uh, one has to necessarily agree that he's always right about everything. Um, but like most competent people, he's usually right about most things. Uh, I'm getting away from that again, I'm getting into specific, I guess, physical issues concerning the city. Um, there seems to be some controversy surrounding the Charles Brooks Peace Fountain, so whether or not there were precedents where the past fountains have not worked out, they broke down, and yeah. cost a lot of money. Yeah. Was there a lot of opposition to this particular fountain, or is there still? Or? Oh, much less. Uh, once they turned it on, and people saw it. Uh, the opposition really melted away uh, for the most part. There's some. The cost is the only opposition, I think, now. Uh, and first of all, this fountain is unique. It's the only one there is like it. Right? It's uh, you know you can say that about other fountains too, of course. But it's, it's one of the fountains. It's a waterworks display, and uh, it, it had to be invented. And it's a very complex thing. And so there were a lot of problems from the very beginning. Uh, uh, and there was the concern that the city the city would get stuck with a big bill. And it was uh, very funny uh, in a sense that uh, here was uh, a half a million dollars or so, whatever the amount was, uh, 350000 raised by the public. The city didn't put any of that money. All we have to do is operate. Right? The city built the park, which is being built anyway. Right? Uh, but the fountain itself did not cost the city anything. It's been the yearly operating costs that cost the city. And uh, that, uh, you know, it, uh, for, for the amount of pleasure that the number of people get out of that fountain, I think it's, it's well worth it. Uh, think of the cost of various gardens, and, you know, ball fields, and swimming pools, and all kinds of things that uh, you compare the cost of the fountain, those things are very modest. But once an issue becomes public, and people don't like something. And one of the reasons that there was a lot of opposition from people who lived nearby and was simply that this was going to cause traffic problems around their home. Uh, that was some of the people who lived nearby, not all of them. But 
you know, so that uh, being in a, in a well-off, uh, upper-middle-class part of the city, uh, the people who lived in that area had the capacity to, you know, influence uh, various uh, other people in the city, and uh, to make more noise than, you know, than some other group might have made, or to not make noise, at least uh, create, uh, create uh, uh, opposition. Uh, a lot of people thought, well, why is it going to be out there? Why shouldn't it be downtown? You know, it should be downtown. The only problem is the physical capacity for it being downtown is not there. You know, uh, if uh, we didn't have railway boats and barges going back and forth all the time, it might have been possible. But we needed a particular kind of site. That cove was built you know, more or less for it. And so the site was to some degree determined. Um, and so there were all kinds of problems like that. But the fact that it was, and this is always the case, when, when people, when, when the city, or no, especially the city, does anything for the sake of beauty and recreation only, there's going to be a, a certain number of people say that we need to put bread on our table, it's going to do this, that, the other thing. I think it boils down to that. So anything the city does of this type is uh, likely to uh, generate a lot of controversy. But once it's in operation, that controversy tends to melt away after a while. Uh, the the uh, the fountain itself is a very sophisticated technical piece of equipment, and therefore has been subject to some breakdowns, some problems. But uh, over the last couple of years, over the line, though, so. what group originally financed? Oh, was uh, by a large public subscription. The unions were very involved. The Wendy Foundation uh, and the city, of course. Uh, as you know, encouraging, encouraging. If the city did not actually spend money to buy the fountain. It was raised by <coughs> private funds. What other kinds of projects in the city are similar to that in that they first received the opposition from possibly milking? Well, I don't know. Let me see. The present arena discussion is in that mm -hmm. area. Whether although uh, it's too early to say anything about that because all that's in, in, in train now is a feasibility study and it may well be that they will be considered to be unfeasible. Uh, oh, things like the art gallery and uh, uh, even the library, any, you know, anything that uh, parks. The you know? um, uh, gardens, uh, the, the British American hotel site, okay. when we bought that, uh, and at a fairly high price. Uh, unfortunately, the price was high because we didn't buy it when we should have bought it, as soon as it was available. You know? uh, people were saying, what do you need more parks for the winos to sleep in, etc., etc., etc. But no, you know, it would be hard. Most people in Windsor would find it, now that the park's there, if somebody made a proposition, is, you know, we've got a good, we've got a customer for that little piece of park and uh, we'll put up a building on it. And people would consider that. An unacceptable idea. So I, that's the British American site, probably a good example. I'd like to mm -hmm. Willistead. Uh, we spent a lot of money on that. Okay. Um, but the choice was to let it you know, fall down, basically. Not fall down, but mm -hmm. become very deteriorated. Um, so I, it, there's always a lot of opposition, some opposition, to uh, doing anything that doesn't strike one as you know, going to immediately uh, lead to uh, money on, in somebody's pocket, which parks and recreation and fountains and things of beauty don't. Uh, this past year, you were also inter uh, involved in a discussion on whether or not the American flag should remain downtown on the mm -hmm. three poles over there. Mm -hmm. um, what are your feelings about that? What kind of opposition did you face? Oh, I faced opposition mainly from people who weren't really interested in the real issue. All they saw was, well, we have American tourists and they find it nice to have the flag, their flag, you know, uh, greeting them and they feel at home and they'll be more prone to spend money and it's a friendly one. The issue is this, that this is Canada, it's a Canadian city, and it's a public flagpole. And you simply don't fly the flag of another country on your public flagpole except on ceremonial occasions. You know, uh, for specific purposes. You don't do it every day. I don't expect to find the Canadian flag flying in front of, uh, on, a, on a public flagpole 
in the United States on a daily basis. Uh, you go to Florida and you go past motels where a lot of Canadians stay and you see you know, Canadian flags on those motels and fine, that's for business purposes. I don't care what businessman flies what flag, you know, wherever. Uh, on his own private property, that's his. But in an official capacity, I don't expect to go to Fort Lauderdale or, you know, Fort Myers or Tampa or wherever a lot of Canadians go down south and see the Canadian flag flying in front of City Hall. You know, what, because uh, it, it, you know, it makes us feel good and we'll continue to go there and spend more money? In other words, the flag is not something you use uh, as a bait for tourism. And uh, it's, I, what it boils down to is it was a discussion of Canadian nationalism, as far as I was concerned. But uh, people turned it into a discussion of, uh, of you know, what's good for business. And uh, that to me was uh, uh, sad more than anything, because it's just a very small microcosm of the problems that Canadians face in terms of generating for themselves the proper self-image of themselves, proper pride. Besides business uh, interests, sir, do you think possibly an American flight might generate any kind of war towards Americans coming over? Or, or, or no? Um, well, certainly. I mean, it would make them feel welcome. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they don't expect to see it when they go to France or Britain. But with the proximity now to Detroit, yeah. geographically. It's always been. Right? <laughs> Again, American flags in people's windows. Etc. But we're talking about public flagpoles on in a public place in Wendy. And what should have been there was the flag of Canada, the flag of Ontario, and the flag of Wendy. Instead, there was the flag of, uh, of uh, I don't know if it was Windsor or Ontario was missing, or Canada. Yeah. And beyond that, I mean, there's a certain protocol to flags. Our flag should have been Canada should not fly on an equal level with any other flag. Right? This is the only place in the world where the Canadian flag takes precedence. Right. right. And it should be. I don't expect it to elsewhere. But it should be. So, I mean, it's, you know, maybe a small matter, but I think it's reflective of the way people think, or more to the point, don't think about what it is to be Canadian. Uh, on special occasions, July the 1st, Freedom Festival. Sure, you know, in the Freedom Festival period, it's dedicated to the friendship of the two countries. Yeah, it should be Canadian American flags, you know, flying together all over the place. But every day of the year on a full-time basis. Americans, when they come over here, should be made to feel at home, okay? That they should be made to, they should be encouraged to remember that they're not at home while they're feeling at home. Uh, there's a different place, there's different laws, and uh, one would think that some of the allure of coming here is because we are different, not because we're the same. Anyway, not for that. You're familiar at all with Canadian-American relations going back to your uh, seminar uh, involvement in mm -hmm. the 60s. Yeah, right? yeah. What kinds of speakers did you uh, see there while you were involved with them? Oh, gee, uh, wide, wide variety of speakers. Uh, uh, from uh, very high levels in the Canadian government. Uh, uh, not while I was directing it, but uh, Lester Pearson, for instance, at one time. Mr. Sharp. Uh, Chrétien. John Robarts. Uh, from the Canadian side, from the American side, people like uh, George Ball, who was assistant deputy. Secretary of State or Deputy Secretary of State, um, Senator Hart, and uh, a wide variety of uh, very important uh, people in various areas of economics and government that whose names perhaps would be less familiar to the average person that were on both sides of the, of the border, extremely important. I always felt it was a, a good exercise in first Canadian-American relations and then what it's developed into now. And I think just as important, comparing the Canadian and American experiences in the same fields, like in insurance and in uh, pharmaceutical industry. And that's the way it's gone now, what it is is sort of comparative. Uh, 
we get people from both sides of the border involved in various issues like energy and you know, like uh, transportation I mentioned medical care you know, pharmaceuticals insurance those are five or six topics lately sports and athletics uh, and to compare what's going on in one country as opposed to the other country it's very good for setting up connections between important people who will you know perhaps out of that continue to deal with each other and information about how we do some things and how they do some things. Like there are ways in which we do some things better than they do. There are, some way, there are obviously ways in which they do some things better than we do. So, um, I always found that to be uh, an important aspect. And of course, my, in terms of professional uh, interest, I've taught in the Canadian-American field. Uh, and uh, in my teaching of Canadian government, I always uh, stress the importance of the American influence uh, in both positive and negative ways. Uh, what other kinds of things has the seminar done for Windsor? Was well, it done for Windsor? Well, it, you know, it's an annual convention, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, to the degree that conventions bring people who spend money into the city, it's, it does that. Uh, it's put us on the map for a lot of uh, reasonably important people who perhaps have never been in Windsor before know that Windsor's here. That isn't necessarily any, doesn't directly impact on the city at any one given time, but over time, you know, the more that uh, people know that the University of Windsor is here and uh, that the city is here, uh, the better for us. And of course for the University, it's, it's uh, given us some uh, visibility and some major events on the University calendar. and. Uh, What's good for this university is good for the city. You may mention that it had changed its format slightly. You know, mm -hmm. Why did it change? Well, because you, you know you can you can't talk about Canadian American relations every year, mm -hmm. in the sense that uh, you you can find something new to say every year. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from year to year, in the past, the focus changed with Canadian American relations in energy and Canadian American relations in this, that, and the other thing. Now we could come back to a general review of Canadian American relations. You know two, three, four years down the line, and then again go. But it, it was felt that that was kind of stagnating it every year, you know, kind of hands across the border, and what are our problems, and how are we friends, etc. cetera. Um, this other approach, for one thing, it gets a new group of people involved every year. Okay? You deal with a whole new industry or clientele or interest group, and that's, I think, useful too. Who got the ball rolling on that seminar to begin with? And what year Father was Boland, uh, 1959, I think it was. So what do you think he had in mind when he first came? Uh, it was mainly the international relations. Uh, yeah. You know, he, he realized that that was his area. He, he studied Canadian-American problems uh, in history, Canadian-American relations in history. And uh, he um, felt that uh, certainly our place on the border made us the perfect place to uh, to the seminar like this and do studies on this. And he started the ball rolling and it's, it's developed. Now there's an institute, Canadian American Studies Associated, which, of which the seminar is one uh, function, but it publishes papers. You know, people write things and, uh, and they're, uh, they're published as, as occasional papers in the institute. So from an, an academic point of view, it's served a very useful purpose. And I think from a wider point of view, it's, it's put the university on the map somewhere. Uh, could it be that perhaps the University of Windsor is maybe an authority um, in this, uh, inside our country on this particular topic right? because of this kind of thing? I think that uh, we've, you know, uh, developed, uh, let's say, how shall I put it, experience in that area uh, uh, in terms of certain aspects of it, sure. Although, you know, we, uh, like other universities and like other departments here, the question of resources and people able to spend and put a lot of time on this particular topic. Uh, I think uh, Professor uh, Murray, who's uh, uh, now uh, the director, Alex Murray, is uh, you know, certainly noted in, his, in the international business area and uh, be considered an expert in Canadian American international business. But in terms of uh, political science or history or whatever, no, not necessarily. 
uh, from all of your uh, studies and from seminars such as this and participation and, and teaching and whatnot, and probably your knowledge about Americanization here. What uh, are your ideas for us on reports like the Watkins report and, and such as this, the one of the past? Are they accurate? Oh, yeah. There's no doubt, as far as I'm concerned, that uh, Canadians have uh, been too reluctant to uh, develop their own country, take risks in their own country, and uh, there are certain costs associated with this. Now, and the way I, I, I take my leave from people like Watkins, although it's not that evident in the report, but uh, in this kind of the tendency that one seems of strident anti-Americanism. I'm not anti-American. I mean, Americans have seen an opportunity. They've come. They've obeyed our laws. And, you know, uh, they've uh, they've done their thing. But uh, my point is, our law, our laws are wrong. Okay, uh, we've had the most open economy of any industrialized country. Anybody could walk in and do what they want pretty well, and we invited them to do so, and that's been wrong. Um, we do have large savings in this country. We don't direct them well. Now, I'm, I'm happy to see what the government's doing, for instance, in Petrocan, and now not nationalizing, but encouraging through laws the Canadianization of, of, uh, of uh, the oil industry. What's wrong with, in Canada, it's kind of the same thing about the flag, but in a much more important sense, what's wrong with giving Canadians first place in Canada? Uh, giving Canadians advantages over anybody else in Canada. The nationals of every other country get advantages over everybody else in their countries. But in Canada, we, we've treated foreign businesses, you know, being on the same footing. And, uh, and we've had this inferiority complex. We can't do things as well. We don't direct them well. Now, I'm, I'm happy to see what the government's doing, for instance, in Petrocan and now not nationalizing, but encouraging through laws the Canadianization of, of, uh, of uh, the oil industry. What's wrong with, in Canada, it's kind of the same thing about the flag, but in a much more important sense, what's wrong with giving Canadians first place in Canada? Uh, giving Canadians advantages over anybody else in Canada. The nationals of every other country get advantages over everybody else in their countries. But in Canada, we we treated foreign businesses, you know, being on the same footing, and uh, and we've had this inferiority complex. We can't do things as well as other people, but that's stupid. We can. All it took was a little bit of encouragement, and we got a decent film industry going. Okay, now we haven't made films that are classics yet, that you know are worldwide and and in distribution and are are, are liked, and we still you know we use. A lot of American stars, and nothing wrong with that. But we're making jobs for Canadians, right? and we're making profits for Canadians. And those jobs and those profits are going to lead to uh, excellence, hopefully, in the long run. Same thing in the recording industry. We had no recording industry ten years ago. The government came in, said uh, through the CRTC, Canadian Radio and Television Commission, said we got to play thirty percent Canadian music by Canadian composers or Canadian lyricists or Canadian artists or or or, or, or recorded in Canada, one of those kinds of combinations. Um, in, in order, you know, you've got to have 30% of music like that played on, on uh, the radio. Well, what that meant was the Canadian recording industry, which was zero, all of a sudden, you know, existed. Now there are recording facilities, good ones in Canada, that attract foreign people to come here. Uh, and, you know, I'm all for that. I think it's a good idea. And I think we've got to do more of that, really. Uh, um, the uh, problems are engendered by having too high uh, foreign content in our industrial structure. For one thing, when, you know, say an American firm in the United States, say Bendix, to use the local example, when they need to reduce their uh, or constrict their operation. They're certainly going to look at Canada first I mean, in terms of closing down a plant rather than, you know, in the United States. Uh, unless the Canadian plant is so much more profitable that, you know, it's, there's no question. But even if it's more profitable, and there were arguments in the Vendix situation that it was a profitable plant. Um, 
that's the kind of thing that'll happen. Uh, you can't expect the uh, uh, same kind of charitable contribution. Okay, can't expect the same kind of involvement in the community if, if you've got a lot of uh, very top executives or some of the companies uh, are only here for a few years and move back to the states. It's all of those kinds of problems which people don't see, they're not, they, and they do all their research and development in the home country. So we're just kind of like buying the technology, and that's been a major problem for Canada. Our research and development uh, levels have been lower than any other country. We spend a lot less than any other country, and the reason we spend a lot less than any other country is because a lot of foreign firms are spending all of their research and development budgets in the home country. Therefore, a very large number of very major firms in Canada are spending a very limited amount of money in research and development. And the government can't do everything in that. So, to the degree that we don't have private firms doing research and development, uh, uh, you know, we're the losers. We're, we're not going to have the kind of technology that's going to be necessary to, to make jobs for the future. Well, all of those things are problems. Okay? It's not to say that all foreign investment is bad. It is to say that when it reaches a point where it's too dominant in an economy, then there are costs which perhaps exceed the benefits. Mm -hmm. You've been described, or you described yourself one time as a liberal with NDP ideas, or a left-wing liberal. What did you mean by that? Well, I'm a liberal with a small L. I believe in liberalism. Uh, in Canada, I find the Liberal Party uh, the best vehicle for that. Um, I find a lot of the uh, NDP ideas, as I, you know, that quotation, I'm not quite sure how accurate it is, but I, you know, I don't find any offensive about it. A lot of NDP ideas are really left-wing liberal ideas. They're not socialist. Uh, I don't uh, find it useful to take any political creed as a matter of religion. They're all, they all have a use. Okay? Free enterprise, to me, has a use. Uh, to, and its, its use is to try to create jobs, to try to uh, create a healthy society. And in those areas where it does so, I'm all for it. Socialism also has its uses. Uh, and socialist techniques have the same goal. And where socialist techniques are, I consider to be more useful, I'm all for them. So I'm, not, I, I'm in favor of free enterprise where it works. I'm also in favor of government ownership, where it works. Uh, I refuse to be uh, a mouther of slogans and, uh, you know, criticize uh, uh, people simply because they happen to be uh, in a party that I didn't vote for in the last election. Uh, that's what I hold against the NDP, in a sense. People say, well, you know, you have these ideas, why aren't you in the NDP? I often say because they can't find a halo to fit me. Uh, I'm, I'm not a saint or an angel, which uh, a lot of people consider, you know, a, to be a, a necessity to be a, a leading NDP spokesman. Not that I would be a leading, but that's my joke about it. Uh, it's, it's it's not an article of faith with me. On the other hand, I, I don't I don't uh, I find my relations with people who are NDPers very easy because we do share a lot of ideas. Uh, in politics, uh, I, you know, I can define myself negatively, almost more easily. I'm definitely not conservative. <laughs> so, enough said about that. Um, have you been uh, instrumental at all on the federal level, the campaign in yeah. this area? I've campaigned in, in a lot of elections. Uh, uh, you know, it depends on how important, I shouldn't say that, there, every election is important, how uh, important I feel my contribution might be at any particular time. And so in some campaigns I've gotten myself involved a great deal, and other times I've hardly done anything. But I usually, you know, I'm around, you might say. In the last provincial election in uh, Windsor Sandwich, in which Bill Rye was elected, I involved myself as heavily as I had the time to do. How do you think Mr. Rye will differ from Mr. Bonzo's uh, past activities? I think they'll be better. In what sense? In the sense that uh, he's um, uh, he's in the right party, for one thing. That was a partisan thing, among other things. But I think Bill has a uh, uh, a 
coming from his uh, coming from his uh, media communications area. He's obviously better able to communicate. Uh, Ted was very involved in his constituency work, uh, and he got involved with uh, sort of minority interest groups, if you will, minority interests. Uh, I think Bill will perhaps be involved in perhaps broader, more expansive things, which will get him more public recognition. I mean, after all, here's Ted Bounsell on the uh, 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 provincial legislature for how long? Almost a decade. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Dave Cook got in, they almost immediately stole all the limelight from Ted. Now, there's there's more to being uh, there's more to being uh, a politician than being in the limelight. But what your colleagues think of you is important. And given the small number of people in the uh, in the NDP caucus for a bounce not to have been considered as leadership potential at all says something. I think that if Stuart Smith steps down three or four years from now, Bill Rye may well be mentioned in the leadership area, right, once he gets some experience. Because he's certainly going to be one of the most upfront guys in that, uh, in that uh, uh, kind of caucus. So he's right, he's knowledgeable, he's in the right party. Uh, in conclusion, then, this Windsor faces so many problems, economics, and what happened here. Uh, what do you think are the primary issues facing city council and facing the citizens of the city? Well, the primary issue is how to develop our economy in such a way as that we're not, you know, going to go through these cycles all the time. Which is to say that we have to have more than just the automobile industry. However, we do have the automobile industry, and it's the major industry. So we have to be we have to be able to encourage continued investment in that area as well. The council, through the development commission, will be working, you know, in that direction. The council will be working in the direction of mitigating the problems of unemployed people through its social welfare agencies, etc. Uh, the council worked very hard to encourage, you know, programs like this ILAP program that's now in existence. So it's in the economic area. Now, as with every other council, every other government. Our basic job always is to provide the services that people want efficiently at the least possible cost. And uh, that that's not easy. So uh, I, I would think in, an, in a specific economic issue, I think our government, our municipal government's uh, job is to continue hammering away at the province to get us equity, uh, to get us in a position where we're getting as much money to run the city from the province as other comparable cities are on a capital basis. I think those are the major issues. You know, you can get into all other kinds of issues. I think we have to, when things get a little better and the economy's a little healthier, we have to forge ahead some more and get our sewers up to date. We've got to get our parks up to date. Not up to date, but more of them. Uh, we've got to expand services huh, to make the quality of life in the city better. So those are all sort of general platitudinous, I suppose, but uh, Nonetheless, they're true. Well, on behalf of the Windsor Public Library, thank you very much for participating in this hearing. My pleasure.